In our last episode, the Chosen One did such vulgar things that YouTube decided my entire episode needed to be demonetized for not being advertiser friendly. I'm not even kidding. But Signor Mordino was pleased with our work, and he gave us one final task to assassinate the leader of the Salvatore family. We find the Salvatore family inside Salvatore's bar on 2nd Street, right across the street from the Shark Club. Heading inside, the employees aren't very helpful. I can't help you, they literally say. And the patrons here are equally antisocial. Talking to the guy sitting at the bar, the man doesn't even glance up as you approach him. He's staring at the wall behind the bar. Uh, hey, we can say. Heard any good rumors? But he gestures for us to shut up and let him drink. We can leave him alone. The bartender doesn't have anything to say, just typical bartender dialogue. He has a few drinks for sale, but no money to barter with. Moving to the northern wall, we find an unlocked door. This leads to a dining room or a conference room or something. We find one guard here with nothing interesting to say. So heading out, we can take the staircase to the second floor. We arrive on a small, heavily guarded room. There is a door against the eastern wall. Talking to the guard standing in front of it, his name is Mason. You done walking in the wrong place, tribal. Get, he says. What's behind that door? We can ask. And Mason responds sarcastically. Behind that door? That door right there? Why, that's Mr. Salvatore's room. Now beat it. We get the distinct impression that if we want to get anywhere with this guy, we're going to have to be a little tough. So we can say, look, jerk, do you still want to have your job tomorrow? I have some info about one of the other families in Reno that Mr. Salvatore is going to want to hear. So let me speak to him now. And Mason's face reddens. He suddenly speaks to the air. Excuse me, Mr. Salvatore. This is Mason. This man says he's got something you want to hear. Mason pauses, listening to something that we can't hear. After a moment, his teeth clench. Mr. Salvatore says you may come in, Oxhorn. Thanks, jerk face, we can say. I'll be sure to mention your manners to Mr. Salvatore. But Mason stops us. Look, he says, and he leans in and lowers his voice. Some ground rules, boy. Don't waste Mr. Salvatore's time. And don't give him any bullcrap or you'll answer to me. Understood, we can say, but Mason stops us again. I ain't done yet. You show him respect. You call him Mr. Salvatore at all times. And when he talks, you shut up and listen. Understand? What Mason tells us right here is really important to bear in mind because only by following these directions do we accumulate invisible reputation points with Mr. Salvatore. Invisible reputation points that he uses to decide whether or not to give us more advanced tasks later. So if we want to unlock all possibilities with Mr. Salvatore, we've got to be respectful. Understood, the chosen one can say. With that, we can walk to the door. You can go in this time, says Mason. Heading in, we see him. And at last we can talk with Mr. Salvatore face to face. Now, we're here to kill him. At least, that's what we told Signor Mordino. But Mordino is only one of the four crime families here in Reno. Before deciding which crime family to side with, if indeed we want to side with any at all, it may be prudent to spend some time with each of them to learn exactly what makes them tick. And so we'll put Signor Mordino's quest to kill Mr. Salvatore on the back burner for a bit and work with the Salvatores. The elderly man looks up at you. His face is gaunt and covered with liver spots. He is holding a breathing mask which is connected to an oxygen tank by his side. What do you want of me? And I'm sorry about that. I only have one sickly, elderly, Italian mafia guy stereotype voice. So I'll probably be reusing this voice for all of the crime bosses. We find a number of pitfalls in this dialogue tree. If we even mention the Lightbringers that we've heard so much about in town, he'll turn hostile. We'll butter this guy up a bit. Mr. Salvatore, you have a reputation for strength and fairness. I want to work for you. Mr. Salvatore takes a breath from the oxygen mask, then gives us a slight smile. Of course. But I require a token 
of your good faith, a sample of your willingness to work for me, he says. What would you have me do, Mr. Salvatore? And he again takes a deep breath from the oxygen mask. There is a man who has used his skill with cards to rub me. The sum is trivial. The insult is not. I want him killed, and the money he stole returned. We again find a pitfall in this dialogue tree that would cause us to lose reputation with Mr. Salvatore. If we say, it could be a rough assignment, can I have one of those laser weapons your family uses? He narrows his eyes. His next words are delivered in a rasping hiss. You have not yet proven yourself. Now go, see Mason. He will have the details of your assignment. If we push him from here, they turn hostile. So to continue, we have to say, I understand, Mr. Salvatore. Forgive my question. I will go see Mason. And here the conversation ends. But by choosing this path, we permanently lose reputation with him, which locks us out of future quests. So instead of asking about the Lightbringers, we should have asked about the Mark. And he would have told us to go and get the details from Mason. Stepping outside to talk to Mason, he says, "'Bout time you showed up, boy. This bomb that stole from Mr. Salvatore. His name's Lloyd. Mr. Salvatore wants him dead and that money he stole back. When you done the job, report back to me, understand? Think you can handle that? Why aren't you tracking down Lloyd, Mason? We can say. And he says, I've been keeping my eyes open, but Lloyd's been pretty careful about keeping out of sight. From Salvatore's eyes, anyway. I'm betting the boss figures you might have better luck being new in town and all. All right, then, we can say, I'll go check, but then his eyes narrow. Of course, if you're implying I ain't doing my job, then you and I can have a discussion up close and personal right now. Mr. Salvatore ain't gonna ask what happened to your sorry butt. The last thing we need is a fight before we even get started with this family, so we can say, Calm down, Mason, I was just curious. All right then, he says. We can then ask him, where can we find Lloyd? And he says, he's been lying low. So tracking him down is going to be your job, boy. Best bet? Check some of the bars along Virgin Street. Lloyd might be running another hustle there. Well, what does Lloyd look like, we can say? And he says, Lloyd? Hell, he's about average height, white, brown hair. Last I saw him, he had a tan shirt and dark brown scarf. He probably ain't changed his clothes since I saw him last. How much did he steal, we can ask? And he says, about a thousand chips. Now look, that ain't nothing to Mr. Salvatore, but he's got this policy with regards to people who take anything from him. If I were you, I'd remember that. Mr. Salvatore's gonna want every chip back. That's all I needed to know, we can say. Stand back. Let me get to work, Mason. Now we have to track down this Lloyd character. Mason suggested we explore some of the other bars around Virgin Street. Well, we are on 2nd Street right now, and the only bar we know of on Virgin Street is the Desperado. So heading south, we can go back into the Desperado, and it's then that we discover a staircase leading to a basement. Heading into the basement, we see stacks of barrels, some noisy machinery, and a bunch of locked doors. Opening the first door to the left, we find a bunch of rats inside. But killing the rats doesn't really give us much. All we find for our efforts is a pile of junk in the northwestern corner. Moving out and heading down to room number two, we can unlock it for the experience. And again, we find more rats to kill. After killing all the rats, we again only find a pile of junk for our efforts. Then heading down, we can unlock door number three for the experience. We again find a bunch of rats to kill. After killing them, we can explore the room. We see a bunch of boxes stacked up here, but we can't open any of them. However, if we explore the southwestern corner of this room, we see something lying on the ground. Picking it up, we see that it's a poison tank. This tank looks suspiciously like an oxygen tank, but there is a small skull and crossbones symbol etched in the bottom. If you hadn't examined it closely, you wouldn't have seen the symbol. It weighs five pounds. 
So a tank filled with poison gas that looks like an oxygen tank? I wonder if this will ever become useful. We'll have to save it for later. Just as we're about to leave, we notice a pathway going behind these big bubbling vats. Heading down the pathway at the end, we find a door. Opening the door, we find... Who are you? What are you doing down here? Says a man. And we notice that he is a white guy of average height with brown hair, wearing a tan shirt and a dark brown scarf. You Lloyd? Pretty boy Lloyd, we can ask? And he stiffens. Maybe. Who are you? I don't believe I've had the pleasure. We find three dialogue trees here, but each tree leads to the same result. So we'll just choose one path and follow it. We can say, look Lloyd. Hand over the cash, and I might forget I ever saw you until you're far away from here. And he says, hmm, I don't think either one of us believes that. Then he swallows, but maybe I can trust you. The money is buried on the Golgotha Plains south of Reno, in one of the graves. Only I know where it is, though. We can say, tell me. And he says, face the sign at the Golgotha Crossroads. Walk northwest until you hit the third grave, then head northeast until you hit the first stake. It's a grave near there marked Arch Stanton. Dig down about six feet, and you'll find it. All right, then, we can say, I'm out of here. Make yourself scarce, and then we let Lloyd leave. If we do, he disappears. But even though we can now go to Golgotha to get the money, we fail the quest for the Salvatores because we let him live. Remember, they wanted him dead. So instead of saying, tell me, we can say, that's the biggest load of, oh, heck. I'm just going to kill you and find the cash on my own. In which case, pretty boy Lloyd turns hostile. We have to kill him, and now we have to search each and every one of the graves at Golgotha to find the money. On his inventory, we find a rope, a shotgun, and some money. Or we can say, oh, forget this horse crap. I'm leaving. Keep your cash and your secret and get out of my sight. With this option, nothing happens, and we can effectively try again. Or we can say, show me. Lloyd looks like he's about to say something, but thinks better of it than nods. All right then, seems I got no choice. Let's go, he says. Now, we find three options here. If we say, I have some stuff to take care of first, you wait here, I'll be back. We leave, and when we come back, he's gone. We miss our opportunity. Instead, we can say, I have some stuff to take care of first. You wait here, I'll be back in an hour. But after we leave, we hide outside his room and then see if Lloyd leaves. And if he does, we follow him. Or we can follow him there at gunpoint. Either way, we arrive at Golgotha. No matter how we get him to Golgotha, once we arrive, Lloyd says, here we are. Whew, the money's in this grave here. We can respond a number of ways. We can say, get out of here, Lloyd. The money is mine now. Right, right, all yours, he says. No problem, I'm leaving. He turns, then walks away. We can shoot him in the back. But he was expecting it. He gets the first shot. Or we can let him go. <laughs> in which case he also opens fire first. He has no intention of letting us dig up his treasure. Or we can say, let me take a look at this grave first. And the dirt around the grave looks like it's been disturbed recently. This would make sense if Lloyd buried the chips here. With this knowledge in hand, we can say, stand back, Lloyd. I'm gonna start digging. But if we do, we trigger an explosive and Lloyd turns hostile. If we had a high enough trap skill, by inspecting it first, we would have discovered the trap, but Lloyd still would have turned hostile. Or we can say, well, stand back and let me dig it out. And without inspecting it first, the explosive still goes off, whether or not we have high trap skill. Or we can say, you dig it up, Lloyd. And he says, uh... And the Chosen One can say, there's two types of people in this world, Lloyd. Those with loaded guns, and those that dig. And Lloyd mumbles under his breath, then proceeds to dig carefully. Less than a minute later, he pulls out a landmine from beneath the dirt and sets it aside. He shrugs sheepishly. 
Nice one, Lloyd, says the chosen one. Keep digging. Let's see what else is under there. A half hour later, Lloyd has dug away enough dirt to reveal a small manhole cover set into the ground. You're certain you wouldn't have found it if Lloyd hadn't told you about it. Lloyd takes a deep breath and wipes his forehead. Old fallout shelter. Open the manhole, Lloyd, we can say. The manhole cover opens with a rusty shriek, revealing a dark hole leading downstairs. Get in there, Lloyd, says the chosen one. Lloyd frowns, thinks about making a comment, then shrugs and climbs down into the manhole cover. Hurry up, Lloyd, we can call down after him. We hear Lloyd grunting down below. Hold on, almost got it. There's a scraping sound, then silence. Get a move on, Lloyd. We haven't got all day. But if we choose this option, nothing happens. Lloyd managed to escape with the treasure out a tunnel in the grave. So instead of telling him to hurry up, we can say, I'm coming down after you, Lloyd. We arrive in the grave and Lloyd turns hostile and he gets in the first shot. Or instead we can say, hey Lloyd, catch! And we can drop the landmine down the hole. All in a day's work, says the chosen one. This grave is different from many of the holes and wells we can access in the game. To enter it, we have to walk our character over it. We can't click on it like we could a ladder or a piece of rope. Inside the grave, we find a chest, and in the chest, a thousand dollars. Strangely enough, we don't find another manhole that Lloyd could have escaped from, so not exactly sure how he could have pulled that one off. With the money in hand and pretty boy Lloyd dead, we can now return to Mr. Salvatore to turn in the quest. But while we're here in Golgotha, we might as well explore a bit, see what's inside all of these graves. Note that digging up each grave does harm our karma. We lose minus five karma for each one. Well, excluding the one we just dug up, and we could potentially get the Grave Digger title. They're dead, they don't care, has become your motto. Digging up the remains of others is more than a hobby for you. But if we're not squeamish about losing karma, or digging up the dead, we can see exactly what's buried here in Golgotha. Golgotha is split up into four quadrants by a cross-shaped road in the middle of the graveyard. This is handy for organizing our efforts. We'll start by digging up the graves and reading the grave markers of the graves in the northeastern quadrant. This one is empty, but the one to the right of this has a gold tooth. This is one of only two gold teeth in the game, and it has no real purpose other than trading. And all we can do with it is sell it. Examining the crosses here, this one says John Doe. The one with the gold tooth reads Amy Presnell, and the empty grave reads Stephen Bakes, age 25, cut down in his prime by the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. That's a, a Hamlet reference. Thank you, Shakespeare. T.D. Hamilton, here lies a Stanko that should have been dead a long time ago. Rest in hell, jerk. Nice. The name and date of this headstone has been worn off by the weather. This one reads, on the 22nd of June, Jonathan Fiddle went out of tune. Okay. Sir John Strange, here lies an honest lawyer. And that is strange. The name on this grave has been scratched out. Sacred to the memory of my husband John Barnes, who died January 3rd, 1803. His comely young widow, aged 23, has many qualifications of a good wife and yearns to be comforted. Wow. Begging for a new man on the headstone of your last one? Jason G. Suin? Suin? And here we find a Golgotha street sign. The wooden sign points to New Reno, to the north, and hell towards Golgotha. We suspect the directions are reversed. This one reads, Thy Dang, may God have mercy on his name. Yeah, that is an awkward name. Rest in peace, Doug Scully Finch. The date does not matter, okay. Killed for smoking in the French market. Last words, donkey punches to ya. Don't Google it. I'm warning you, don't Google it, just, just don't. Josh Walters, 1971 to 2011, died of complications during his fifth liver transplant. With these red, we can dig up the remaining graves we find here. 
This one has a shotgun and shotgun shells. The one north of it has a deck of marked cards, some loaded dice, and 173 bucks. This one's empty. The one northwest of it has a bunch of booze. That's it for the northeastern quadrant. Let's move to the southeastern quadrant. Starting with the northeasternmost grave of the southeastern quadrant, this one is empty. The one due west of this has some booze, a knife, and a small amount of money. Then the one due west of this is empty. Reading some of the headstones, Brahmin Wrangler. Thomas French died while trying to master the flying guillotine. This is a reference to the 1976 film Master of the Flying Guillotine. It's a Thai boxing movie. This movie provided the inspiration for the character Dalzim from Street Fighter, and Quentin Tarantino cited it as one of his favorite movies of all time. She always said her feet were killing her, but nobody took her seriously. Oh, killed by rebellious feet. Gary Plattner killed for not making more vault citizen models. This is another inside joke. Gary Plattner was the senior artist for Fallout and Fallout 2. Guess he only wanted to make two vault resident models, a male and female model, which is why they all look the same. Here lies our beloved son, Richard Wright. You will never be forgotten. This is an important grave we'll come back to visit a little bit later in this series. The children of Israel wanted bread, and the Lord sent them manna. Old Clerk Wallace wanted a wife, and the devil sent him Anna. That's some bitterness and resentment to put on your headstone. Leonard Boyarski, exile from Vault City. Going back to our grave digging, the one just south of the last one has a shovel, a crowbar, and some rope. The one next to this is empty. The one next to this has the body of a teenager in the coffin. As I said, we'll be coming back to this a bit later. And the one next to this is empty. We can read more headstones now. Rupert Dinkos, died winter of 08. Jason Anderson, no longer a living god. Dog bomb is dead. Long live the dog. In a southern grave, we find a doctor's bag and a needle. Here lies Anne Mann, who lived an old maid but died an old man. December 8th, 1767. Heading north, we can uncover the final grave in this quadrant. We find leather armor, a 10 millimeter SMG, and a knife. There are a few more markers. The one north of us has been worn away by the weather. In memory of little Chris Wood, here lies one wood enclosed in wood, one wood within another. The outer wood is very good, though we cannot praise the other. Ouch. Be nice to your family, folks. They bury you. And then the cross in the very middle of this plot is labeled trash. If we come up to examine it, the chosen one says, uh, it's a cross. Now, if we get the magic eight ball from the Shark Club, which I'll talk about in an upcoming episode, and we have high luck, we have a chance to learn that somebody buried some cash beneath the cross labeled trash in Golgotha. Only after obtaining this clue from the eight ball can we come back to Golgotha and visit this cross labeled trash. If we do, the chosen one says, hey, somebody buried some cash beneath the cross. And in so doing, we loot a little bit of cash. The chosen one never tells us how much he looted, but doing a bit of math, we learn that it was 374 bucks. Here lies Ezekiel Akel, aged 102. The good die young. Must have been a naughty guy. Doug Avery hated the war for destroying his trailer park lifestyle. Shanna San Paolo. Fred Hatch died getting Myron's voice recorded. Another inside reference. Rest in peace, Casey Donahue. Died 8698. Killed by mutated, ill tempered bass. So there you have it. Fish do exist in the Fallout universe. Here lies the body of Jonathan Blake, stepped on the gas instead of the brake. Next, we'll move to the northwestern quadrant. This one's been scratched out. This one worn off by the weather. This one reads John Doe. This one, Nietzsche. The reason Charles didn't quite get hockey. Charles Cuevas, he once said, give me hockey or give me death. He didn't quite get hockey. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Nietzsche killed Charles. Gotcha. Here lies Sam Pritchard. He talked too much, so we gave him a second mouth. Ooh, are you doing anything with your life? No, guys, I'm just reading every single headstone in a video game. Fergus Urquhart made just one damn list too many. 
Another inside reference to developers of the game. This one reads John Doe, Scott Rodenheiser built 3D heads. Another inside reference, he was a clay modeler for Fallout, modeling many of the talking heads in the game. This one, worn off by the weather. Ray Muzika, summer of 98. Here lies Moose, cold and dead. We found him here without his head. Saul Deban died September 24th, 1996? 2096? We don't know. Rupert Duikos, who died the exact same date. Dennis Presnell, we can almost hear him now. You call that a funeral? That sucked. You guys are jerks. I'm never dying again. Blah, blah, blah. Scratched below it says, God rest, cry in D. Should have kept on the patch. Probably another inside reference, I'm assuming. This one worn off by the weather. But the next one, Zeb. Still older than dirt. Eric DeMilt, the true combat boy. Another inside reference. Eric was a producer for Fallout 2. With the headstones red, we can start to exhume the graves. Top one has a flower. Moving down, we find some healing powder and a spear. To the right of this, empty. Below this, empty. To the left of this, empty. To the far right, we find some metal armor and some spiked knuckles. To the left of this one, empty. And to the left of this one, a small stash of coin. Here lies Scott Everts. Late for work, late for life. Another inside reference. He was the map designer for Fallout 1 and did map design for Fallout 2 as well. Man, it must have been a lot of fun working with this crowd. With the Northwestern Quadrant explored, we can move to the final one, the Southwestern Quadrant. Here lies the dumbest son of a gun to ever step foot in New Reno. There are no markings on this one. Born 1903, died 1942. Looked up the elevator shaft to see if the car was on the way down. It was. Whoops. Robert Collar, Silent and Deadly Rob. Then, another one worn off by the weather. Nick Kesting, there's a small bucket of round copper slugs on top. Another inside reference, akin to the Kesting special. Reader, if cash thou art in want of any, dig four feet deep and thou wilt find a penny. Sounds good, we'll do that in a bit. Christopher Michael Holland, AKA Chris Holland, AKA Chris, there are two and a half reasons to read this headstone. Normally, you would expect those reasons to be listed. <laughs> Tim Kaine, founder, lover, fighter, programmer. Another inside reference. Here lays Butch. We planted him raw. He was quick on the trigger, but slow on the draw. Here lies an atheist, all dressed up with no place to go. Ed Highland, he told the world to suck it. David Hendy, the loudest among the dead. May he rest in peace quietly. William Liebus, here lies Chris Avalone, king of the dance floor. Another developer reference, good old Chris Avalone. Made an appearance in Fallout 1 too. This one is scratched out. Robert Hertenstein II. The doctor tried to tell him, but he insisted that's a bit too much information. Matt Morton, he could have been someone. He could have been a contender, instead of a bomb, which is what he was. This, of course, a reference to the iconic performance of Marlon Brando in On the Waterfront. You don't understand, I could have had class. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody, instead of a bum, which is what I am. Let's face it. Okay, now we can get to digging. Heading to the first grave to the left, we hear a sound underneath it. Don't step on a grave. It packs the dirt in. That a worm I feel? Oh, never mind. If we dig it up, the chosen one says, Whoa, this grave smells. Oh, well, better keep digging. And if we keep digging, the chosen one says, What the? And out crawls a ghoul. About friggin' time, he says. Could you dig any slower, idiot? Out of my way, smoothie and he begins to shamble off. But if we have Lenny in our party, he says, D Dad? Not now, Lenny, says the ghoul. I ain't in the mood to be talking. Just pop into Reno for a little drinking and whoring and damn smoothies jam me into this doggone grave. Nothing more boring than being in a coffin for months. Ghouls don't get no damn respect. 
Good thing I don't got no nose or I would have choked on my own stink. Hands off, Smoothie. I got places to go. And he walks off. Okay then. Well, we just met and lost Lenny's father. Back to our grave digging, the one to the right of Lenny's dad's grave is empty. The one just northeast of this has a knife and some Morningstar mind script inside. The Morningstar mind script that we first came upon in Reading. The one to the right of this has a leather jacket, a 10 millimeter SMG, and a switchblade. Now the one to the south of this is empty. Unless we have Myron in our party. Remember back when we first met Myron at the stables, if we asked him to wait anywhere, he objected. Then he promised us a reward if we let him stay with us. Could be I know one of Mordino's little stashes in Golgotha outside of Reno. Lots of chips, lots of drugs. Just gotta keep me around. If we bring him to Golgotha, at any time we can ask him about the secret Mordino stash that he talked about. It's around on Golgotha somewhere. I'll let you know when I see it. So to find this stash, we have to walk around and apparently he's supposed to shout out when we're close to the right grave. But in my game, he never did. I did a bit of reading online and I'm not the only one to have experienced this problem. But despite this, we can still find the stash, but only if Myron first told us about it and with him in our party. With those qualifications met, if we take him to this previously empty grave, instead of nothing, we find a stash of buff out, three pieces of jet, some antidote, 223 caliber ammunition, a 44 caliber revolver, a stack of caps, and a gold nugget. We know this is the same cash that Myron was talking about because if we try to talk with him about it again, we find that the option is missing. It disappeared because we found the stash. Moving south of the Mordino stash, this grave has some mirrored shades and some more Morningstar mind script. This item does have a practical purpose. If we place it in one of our weapon slots, it grants us plus one to charisma. It's the only non-consumable item that increases charisma, and we find two of these glasses in the game. So with one in each slot, we can increase our charisma by two points. The other one is in New Reno, and we'll find it in an upcoming episode. Then moving south, the final grave has a flower inside. Here lies Johnny Yeast. Pardon me for not rising. Uh, J. Potato Feet Nelson, musician. Passed on at the age of 104 during a drum solo. And that is absolutely everything in Golgotha. We can now head back to Mr. Salvatore to turn in the quest. You found Lloyd yet? Asks Mason. Lying here and trying to steal the cash from Salvatore will lock us out of more quests, so we'll be honest. Yeah, I found Lloyd. He nods, frowning slightly. Well, all right then. Go tell Mr. Salvatore about what you found. All right, we can say, instead of being rude. Then, walking into the room, we can talk with Salvatore. Salvatore looks up at us, takes a breath from the mask. Have you disposed of the thief, he asks? Yes, we can say. I made an example of him, Mr. Salvatore. He puts his fingers together. And the money? Has it been recovered? Again, we can lie, but we know what'll happen if we do. So we can say yes, Mr. Salvatore. Then he asks how much of it was recovered. I will take my money now, he says. If we cheat him in any way, he knows and turns hostile. So instead, we'll give him the 1,000 chips for this is the correct amount. Salvatore nods at us as we give him the money, but he holds up his hands halfway through the transaction. The remaining half is yours. Thank you, Mr. Salvatore, we can say. Then Mr. Salvatore takes a breath from the mask. I have another matter that requires your attention. I am interested in the job, Mr. Salvatore, we can say. What do you want me to do? A constituent in my district has not paid me tribute for the services I provide, says Mr. Salvatore. Collect it. If he objects, inform him you are my representative in this matter. Talk to Mason for the details. Yes, Mr. Salvatore, I'll go see him, we can say. 
Then, stepping out of his office, we can talk with Mason. All right, then. You're going to be a one-man collection agency, says Mason. Drill simple. Visit Renseco's pharmacy on Commercial Row, collect the tribute, a thousand chips, then bring it back here. All right, anything else we can ask? And he says, don't let Gramps give you any bullcrap. If he does, tell him you work for Mr. Salvatore. That should clear up any misunderstandings. You got that? That's all I need to know, we can say. Thanks, Mason. Now, we need to track down this Renseco to collect his tribute for Mr. Salvatore. And we recall that Renseco was the name of the guy we needed to visit to get the part we need to repair the pump inside the Broken Hills Mine. We'll pick up with this task in my next episode. I publish many Fallout videos each and every week on my channel, so if you don't want to miss it, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have and you still feel like you're missing out on YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I have a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find them on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.